This is part of a series called the Evidence Series, which looks at big life questions. Does God exist? Where did life on planet Earth come from? Is there a supernatural intelligence beyond our physical world? Was Darwin right? The Evidence looks at these big life questions through the lens of science. Now, in our first presentation, we discovered that our universe is expanding in every direction. Galaxies are drifting further and further apart from one another each and every day. So, logically, if you go back in time, every year that you go back in time, our universe was closer and closer and closer together until you come to a place where the entire universe theoretically was condensed into one tight ball or mass of matter. This has led um, some scientists or many scientists to conclude that our universe must have started in a big bang. However, we also looked at evidence, major evidence coming out in current modern scientific discoveries that is causing the Big Bang Theory to be a theory in crisis. We looked at evidence that um, shows the universe spinning in both directions. Moons orbiting planets in both directions. Planets spinning backwards to other planets. We looked at whole galaxies that spin, spin backwards. This is not possible in a Big Bang scenario. We also saw the oldest star in the universe is older than the universe itself. The Methuselah star, first calculated to be 16 billion years old by NASA. Go on NASA's page, Google it after the series, and you'll see that NASA first calculated the age of the Methuselah star as 16 billion years, when the age of the universe is only supposed to be 13.8 billion years. So they continued to sh try and shave as much as they could down on the star and eventually they came up with the solid age of 14 and a half billion years, almost a billion years older than the universe supposedly has existed itself. How can you have a star older than the universe? It just doesn't fit the Big Bang model. And so many scientists are moving away from the Big Bang model and are moving to other models to describe the universe and probably the most popular model today to describe the universe is called the multiverse or multi-universe theory. However, whatever model um, scientists are using today, all of them depend on one essential, essential fact and that is it depends on the universe being eternal. However, there is solid scientific data and reasoning that, um, that states that the universe cannot be eternal. And one of those things is the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics says that all usable energy is being turned into unusable energy irreversibly. If our universe was eternal, there would no longer be any usable energy left in our universe. Because our universe has usable energy, it is, therefore, not eternal. Second law of thermodynamics also says that everything in the universe is gradually and irreversibly moving from order towards disorder. Because we see order in our universe, the universe cannot be eternal. That means that if the universe is not eternal, it had a beginning. And if the universe had a beginning, the only worldview that fits a universe that is not eternal but a uni universe that is finite is a theistic worldview. Tonight, we're going to take our head out of the clouds and come right back down here to planet Earth. We're going to move past galaxies through orbiting planets and down to our own planet, a unique point in our universe 
Up until this point, the only place known in all of scientific discovery to contain life. Think about that. The only place up until this point known in all the vast universe to contain life. What makes this planet so special? And where did life on planet Earth come from? Well, let's look at that together as we search the evidence. We begin with the story of Charles Darwin and how the theory of evolution came into being. At the age of 22, Charles Darwin got the opportunity of a lifetime, a round-the-world voyage on a ship called the HMS Beagle. This remarkable journey not only changed Darwin's view of the world, but shook science as nothing else had. Now, once he got on the ship, he was handed a book, a special book, called Principles in Geology, written by the geologist Charles Lyell. Lyell's theory said that rocks were millions of years old. Canyons took vast amounts of time to form. All of this Lyell called deep time. So Lyell's theory was that whatever you see on the planet, whatever geological structures, mountains or canyons, whatever you see must have taken millions or long periods of time to form. Darwin had two months to read this book. And by the time the ship had landed in South America, he was fully convinced that Charles Lyell was right. There was one other influential book that Darwin read on his voyage, a book written by his grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, who was a doctor, a medical doctor. This book claimed that all animals were related to one another. The book's, the book's name was Zoonomia. This thought had a tremendous impact on Charles Darwin. Well, as the ship traveled around South America charting the coastline, Darwin sought to explain everything he saw through the deep time theory he had learned from Lyell. This proved pivotal when the boat finally landed on the western shores of South America among the Galapagos Islands. There, Darwin noticed slight changes among, between mockingbirds on the islands and those mockingbirds on the mainland. This was revolutionary for Darwin, for up until this moment, not only Darwin, but the culture that Darwin grew up in, as well as Charles Lyell, all believed that species were fixed, that they couldn't change at all, that once a mockingbird has a stripe through its eye, it's always going to have a stripe through its eye, and it's never going to have anything but a stripe through its eye. Species couldn't change at all. And what Charles Darwin observed was that mockingbirds were different and had changed from the island to the mainland. Darwin also noticed that finches on the different islands had different sized beaks. With the lens of deep time provided by Charles Lyell and the lens of his grandfather's book, Zoonomia, which implanted the idea that species are all related together, Charles Darwin began to believe that everything, every life form that he saw, had one common ancestor. Once Darwin was back from his voyage, he began to develop his theory. And his theory goes something like this. His theory starts off by saying, over vast amounts of time. Where did he get that part of his theory from? From Charles Lyell. Over vast amount of time, small and slight changes within species. Where did he get that from? His observations on the Galapagos Islands explains how all species are connected. Where did he get that from? His grandfather Erasmus Darwin in his, and the book Zoonomia. Over vast amounts of time, small and slight changes within species explains how all species are connected and now comes the novel or new thought through a common ancestor. And that's how the theory of evolution developed. The link was now made. Darwin published his book, Origin of Species, November 1859. In Darwin's book, the illustration of an evolutionary tree shows how all living things, plants, fish, animals, and humans, trace their, their common ancestry back to a single life form. 
Darwin's theory was an attempt at explaining the entire world and the diversity we see in it from one original life source. He wrote, all organic beings which have ever lived on this earth have descended from some one primordial form. So with this idea, Darwin had a theory that explained life on earth. But there was one major problem. How did that first one life or one primordial form, form. Where did it come from? Darwin's theory didn't address that. All it addressed was that once there was a little cell, and then that little cell split, and eventually it turned into a squirrel, and then the squirrel turned into a monkey, and, and then from a monkey it turned into my great-grandfather, and then, and then here I am. Right? No, okay, well, kind of. But where did this single cell come from? Where did that one primordial source come from? Well, Darwin sought to explain everything through natural means. So in Darwin's mind, the first life had to come from non-living things that existed before it. In other words, that living cell had to have come from rocks, dirt, chemical elements, non-living matter. Non-living matter had to give rise to the first living life form. That's how evolution works. How it happened, Darwin didn't know. Whatever was on this planet before the first form of life was the stuff that life came from. So the haunting question for the theory of evolution was really, how do you get life from non-living matter? The entire theory of evolution was based upon slight changes over long periods of time. Therefore, if the first life form could not be explained through slight changes over a vast amount of time, the theory of evolution would fall apart. Darwin explained it this way in his own words. If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would what? Absolutely break down. So let's take a look at how scientists have sought to explain the origin of life from non-living matter. The origin of life from non-living matter is called chemical evolution or abiogenesis. This is the dictionary definition, the evolution of life or living organisms from inorganic or inanimate substances. This theory um, about how uh, living matter came from non-living matter dates all the way back to who else but Aristotle and ancient Greek philosophy. According to Aristotle, everyone could readily observe that the tiny insects called aphids, well, those things really came from raindrops. Flies? Well, flies spontaneously popped out of rotting food. Mice? Mice came from dirty hay. And everybody knew that crocodiles come from lo rotting logs. This theory of Aristotle was later disproved by the inventor of the microscope. His name is Antony Leeuwenhoek in 1680. I guess crocodiles don't come from rotting logs. But with the technological advances in science, by the 1800s, scientists thought that life must have come from an original single-celled organism. This was easy to believe at that time. Because science at that time believed that a single-celled organism was sim simply a globule of plasm, like a dollop of jello. All you have to do is explain how that dollop of jello is kept together, and you have your first living cell. Today, we understand that explaining the existence of a cell is not as easy as they once thought. You need much more than a cell wall to describe or to come up with a living cell. Instead, cells are very complex structures. They're literally made up of hundreds of different proteins that all carry out essential functions within the cell. Without proteins, you cannot have a living cell. A living cell depends upon hundreds of different proteins in order to exist and function and live. 
Now Darwin must have understood that proteins were the key to understanding the first life because in a letter dated to February 1, 1871, Darwin suggested to a friend that this first life started in a warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia, phosphoric salts, light, heat, and electricity present that a protein co compound was chemically formed ready to undergo still more complex changes. So, Darwin was right. Scientists today agree that before you can explain the first life, you must explain the evolution of the first protein from chemicals. Chemicals need to somehow transform into proteins if you're going to have a living cell. Let me explain a little bit about proteins. Proteins are little three-dimensional machines that carry out hundreds of necessary jobs in the cell. Some proteins provide structure, like a skeleton, and they make up our bones. Other proteins, like enzymes, speed up reactions in the cell to hundreds of times faster than it could, that reaction could occur without the help of these enzymes. Others are used to transmit signals in and out of the cell to communicate. Others are used to transport waste and nutrients in and out of the cell. Others act like an army binding to foreign invaders. So proteins are not only incredible, but they are essential to every cell. So how are proteins formed? Well, proteins are made up of tiny molecules called amino acids. There are 20 different types of amino acids. You could almost picture an amino acid as a colored block. And each color of a block represents a different type of amino acid. And there are 20 different types or 20 different colors of amino acid. You've heard of the 31 flavors. Anybody here had 31 flavor ice cream, right? Well, when you get into the world of proteins, you don't get 31 flavors. You only get 20. All right, I'm sorry. Rocky Road's there, so just be happy, right? So we have the 20 different amino acids. These amino acids need to line up in a very specific sequence in order to form a functioning protein chain. It kind of works like this. A specific protein chain will be very, very specific. You may have a red amino acid followed by a blue amino acid, followed by a yellow amino acid, and then a green one, then a blue one, and then a red one, and then a purple one, and then a yellow one, and then a green one. And only when they're lined up in this specific sequence do you have this specific protein. Does that make sense? If you get one of those in the wrong order or missing, the whole protein chain goes limp and is completely and totally useless. Now, if you have 20 available amino acids to put in a chain, you can view them as a sequence of numbers. Let's say that you have amino acid number one, followed by amino acid number five, followed by amino acid number 20, and so on. A single amino acid out of place, missing, or in the wrong order, and the whole protein chain just falls apart and goes limp. Now, the average protein chain is 300 amino acids long, all correctly sequenced in the, right, uh, in the correct sequence. So the average protein is how long? 300 amino acids long, 300 correctly sequenced amino acids. And that's just the average. So here's what you need for chemical evolution to work. Here's what you need to go from rocks to a living cell. First of all, you need to explain how amino acids are formed from chemicals in the wild in nature. How could it have happened in nature where chemicals spontaneously form amino acids, right? That's the first thing you need to come up with. After you come up with that, you have to figure out how these amino acids are going to bind together to form a chain. Then you need each one of those amino acids not just simply to connect with one another, but you need those amino acids to sequence themselves in the right order. Because if they're not sequenced in the right order, you're not going to have a working protein chain. Once a correctly sequenced chain is formed, it must then be folded into a precise 
three-dimensional structure. If the chain is not folded into a precise three-dimensional structure, that protein does not work. It's like, um, it's like a hammer or a saw. A hammer and a saw have a very precise um, shape for a very specific function, right? You wouldn't use a saw to hammer in a nail. Neither would you use a hammer to cut down a tree. And the same thing is true with a protein chain. A protein chain that is not folded into the precise shape to do its job will not work at all. It will be a useless, uh, a useless chain of amino acids. So you need all of these things, and then you need a whole bunch of different proteins all correctly folded to make a living cell. This is what you need to go from a rock to a living cell. These are all the steps. So scientists went to work to see if they could start with step number one and find and see if they could create chemicals from amino acids. Stanley Miller in 1953 did a revolutionary experiment to simulate Darwin's warm little pond. He built this little contraption here, and you can see right down here at the bottom, he had a container or a flask where he poured in um, several different ingredients. He combined methane, ammonia, hydrogen, water, all without oxygen, and then heated it all up to turn it into a vapor. The vapor then traveled up this tube, over and around, and as the vapor dropped into this area here, he had electrical sparks that continually sparked the vapor, um, creating an electrical current through this vapor. He sparked it over and over and over again, and then as the vapor cooled and descended, it turned into liquid, and then whatever elements were created here got trapped down in the trap at the bottom of his experimental um, contraption. The amazing thing is that after two weeks, he was able to produce 13 of the 20 amino acids from chemicals. 13. This was hailed a scientific breakthrough. But did this close the case on how proteins were formed? No, not yet. You see, Miller had accomplished the first and easiest of all steps. The more challenging problem was to get those amino acids to connect to one another. And none of them did in Miller's experiment. No amino acids chain, chains formed. No proteins were created. The closest that science has ever come has been to artificially produce 13 amino acids by zapping gases over and over and over in an oxygenless, perfect environment. And the amino acids could form if, they, if the conditions were perfect. That's what it proved. But what if the conditions weren't perfect? What about in the wild where you do have oxygen? What about in the wild where lightning strikes don't happen as frequently as they happened in this, uh, in this experiment? Would it produce the same results in a non-perfect environment? If they did form in the wild, how did they connect together? Dean Kenyon sought to answer this question by saying, life might have been biochemically predestined by the properties of attraction that exist between its chemical parts, particularly between amino acids and proteins. What Dean Kenyon was saying is that, I think amino acids have some sort of magnetic connection or some sort of, uh, some sort of biochemical connection where they naturally just line up without any help from anything outside itself. Five years after writing this paragraph in his book, Dean Kenyon began to question his own position. He was challenged by one of his students who told him that the formation of proteins is impossible without the information in DNA. DNA is needed in order to form proteins. Dr. Kenyon has since rejected his own book and said, without DNA, my student is right, without DNA, you are left with random chance. Amino acids do not normally uh, form on their own. So in order for you to go from rocks to a living cell, this all had to have happened through random, undirected chance. 
It's kind of like a, uh, trying to come up with the right sequence by guessing the numbers in a combination lock. But guessing the combination on a lock is much, much easier than guessing the sequence of amino acids and proteins. Now, on a lock, you have three to four places, right? And each one of those places has how many numbers? You can have 10 numbers to guess from in each place. So that's what you'd need to guess the combination on a simple lock. A protein is much more complex. Instead of three or four places, you have 300 or 400 different places. And in each place, instead of 10 numbers to choose from, you have 20 numbers or 20 am different amino acids to choose from in each place. So what's the probability of getting a protein to form by chance, by a random, undirected process. What are the odds? Well, a short protein chain is made up of about 100 to 120 amino acids. To just put that into perspective, the longest human protein chain is Titan, with 34,350 amino acids. That's a big protein. So, uh, we're a long way away from the largest protein by just saying, let's guess a small protein, one that's only 150 amino acids long. What would the odds be of getting a 150 amino acid long protein chain to sequence itself by chance in the right sequence? Well, you have a 1 in 20 chance for each protein. Uh, point or each position. So if you had a protein chain that was one amino acid long, you would have a 1 in 20 chance of getting that protein right, getting it sequenced right, right? Stanley Miller showed that 13 amino acids could form in two weeks, so you have maybe a month. You could probably get, get one amino acid protein chain right in a month. But what about something, what are the odds of a protein that is 150 amino acids long? How long would that take? Well, your chances are 1 times 10 to the 195th power. That's 1 with 195 zeros behind it. Now, that's a huge number. Let me put that into perspective for you. Just to put, in, put that into perspective, in the whole known universe, scientists estimate that there are 10 to the 80th power of elementary particles. That's protons, neutrons, and electrons in the entire universe. There is a greater chance for you to find one marked proton or one specific electron searching the entire universe than for one simple, short, small protein chain to, to be lined up correctly by chance or by an undirected process. Now, let's say that for every second on a watch, a new amino acid combination was tried. Okay? One, two, three, four. Every second, you're trying a new combination. How long would it take for you to form or guess? If you're guessing every second, how long would it take you to guess a protein chain that was 150 million or 150 amino acids long. Well, according to probability, you would need 1 times 10 to the 195th seconds. If the universe is 14 billion years old, you would have a total of approximately 4 times 10 to the 17th seconds in all the time in the universe. You don't have enough time in the entire universe. You don't have enough seconds in the entire universe to come up with a single protein. From the moment that scientists say that the Big Bang exploded until today, there isn't enough time in the entire universe to form a single protein by chance. And we're not talking about Titan, the 34,000 long one. We're talking about the little squeaker, you know, the one right at the bottom, 150 amino acids long, that little guy. You don't have enough time in the entire universe. There are 30,000 different proteins in our world. 30,000. And most of those proteins average 300 to 400 
um, amino acids long. So coming up with amino acids was the first problem. Since science has proven this can happen in a perfect environment, the second problem is forming a protein or sequencing a protein um, right. And science has proven, statistics has proven that this cannot happen even in a perfect environment. There's just not enough time in the entire universe to sequence, um, to sequence it correctly. The third issue is that amino acids need correct, the correct bonds in order to form a protein. To form a functional protein, amino acids have to have a specific bond called a peptide bond. And this bond only occurs 50% of the time. Without this peptide bond, a protein cannot be formed. In a protein that requires 150 amino acids, you have 149 bond sites, which means that you have a uh, 1 in 10 to the 49th power chance of getting all the bonds correct in a short protein chain. That's the probability of getting all the bonds peptide bonds, which only happen 50% of the time. But there's one other thing that needs to happen. Amino acids come in two forms. You have left-handed amino acids and you have right-handed amino acids. Proteins are only formed by left-handed amino acids, which means that once again, the chances of all the bins being left-handed are 1 times 10 to the 49th power. So, for a protein to form by chance, you need all the amino acids, you need amino acids to form from chemicals. That was shown to be partly at least true by Stanley Miller. We can do that. Amino acids need to um, correctly sequence, and that cannot happen by chance. There's not enough time in the entire universe for it to sequence correctly. But even if you could sequence them correctly, you would still have to get the correct bonds, which the probability of that happening is 1 times 10 to the 49th power. And if you got that correct, you'd need the right bins. The only left-handed amino acids could, be, could form uh, in proteins. And again, the chances are 1 times 10 to the 49th. And if you got all of that correct, and you, and you were able to do all of that by chance, you still haven't arrived at the place Darwin began. Because it takes 250 to 400 proteins to form a simple, single cell. Now you tell me, is probability on the side of evolution when it comes to proteins being formed from chance? Absolutely not. There is no way in the entire universe that this could form. Science now agrees that the only way that this can form, the only way that for proteins can for form is that you need the information in DNA to sequence those proteins correctly. Everyone knows about DNA, right? DNA contains a very complex code, more complex than any computer ever built. This code has all the information needed to manufacture proteins. So how does it happen? Well, inside every cell, whether it's the cells in your body, the cell in a giraffe or a skunk, or even the cell in a simple bacteria, the protein formation happens the same way around the world in every single form of life. Every form of life. In the nucleus of the cell, you have a tightly coiled strand of DNA, all coiled up like a scroll, all rolled up just waiting to be read. When a protein is going to be formed, there's a structure that comes into the nucleus of the cell, a protein structure, it's actually an enzyme, called RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase comes to this tightly wound strand of DNA in the cell's nucleus, and it begins to unwind a section of the DNA. Once it unwinds a section, the section of the DNA that is specifically designed to code a sequence for a specific protein, the RNA polymerase runs along that, that strand of DNA and makes an exact copy of the code, like a photocopy, Xerox copy. That copy that comes out off of the RNA polymerase is a strand called 
RNA. The RNA, which is located there, moves outside the cell nucleus, and as it goes into outside the cell nucleus, still inside the cell, it travels to the outer layer of the cell where it finds a new machine. And this machine is called a ribosome. The ribosome is like a little factory. Well, once RNA arrives at the ribosome, there's another protein, um, protein machine called tRNA enzyme that begins to bring amino acids to the ribosome. One at a time, these little amino acids, it comes along like a little minion carrying its little packet. Here you go, going to get another one. And finally, one, as it delivers the amino acids, the RNA is run through the ribosome and the ribosome begins to read the sequence of how these amino acids are supposed to line up. And it begins to sequence these amino acids. Okay, we need a red one, we need a blue one, we need a green one, and it begins sequen sequencing these amino acids. The amino acids come out the other side of the ribosome as a protein chain. As it comes outside the ribosome as a protein chain, that protein chain travels to another factory, a barrel-shaped factory called a chaperonin. The chaperonin takes this this protein chain into its barrel shape and folds it. It folds it left, it folds it right, it folds it over until it's folded that protein into the precise shape that that protein needs to be folded into that was coded in the DNA. It's amazing. And this happens in every cell in your body, in my body, in a giraffe's body, in a monkey's body, and in a bacteria's little cell. It happens all over the world like this. And finally, that folded protein now exits the chaperonin and is now able to be used by the cell, in the cell, with the cell. One of the proteins that is most helpful in the cell are proteins called enzymes. Enzymes help speed up cellular activity to unimaginable speeds, one times 10 to the 18th power. Think of this, if you didn't have enzymes, the same job that takes seconds in a cell, without the enzyme, that same job would take millions of years. So enzymes are crucial to the function of cells. Because these things, these processes need to happen very, very, very quickly. Here's the dilemma for evolution though. Enzymes are necessary in order to read the code in DNA. The code in DNA is necessary to create enzymes. So which one came first? The enzyme or the code in DNA? Do you see the dilemma? Unless they both existed at precisely the same moment, neither one of them could exist or function. This is a scenario that you see over and over and over and over in biology that does not fit the evolutionary model, but fits very well into an instantaneous creation sort of a model. Now, without DNA, you cannot have life. Scientists are realizing this. You have to have the instruction codes in DNA for life to begin. Bill Gates of Microsoft says that human DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any we've ever created. Bernard Olaf Coopers, a German biologist, says that the problem of the origin of life is clearly basically equivalent to the problem of the origin of biological information. In other words, the origin, the problem of the origin of life is equivalent to the problem of how did that code get in the DNA? How did it get there? How did that information get in the DNA which is in every person's cell? How did it get there? Without information, you can't have life. That, so let's look at the information in DNA. Now there are three essential elements for DNA to work in the cell. First, you need a language. In order for information to be communicated, you need a language. If I were to come up to you and you, uh, you and I were to look each other in the face, 
and neither one of us had a language, we'd sit there and stare at each other throughout e eternity. And no information would cross. I mean, there might be a lot of information in your brain and a lot of information in my brain, but without, informa without a language, that information can't be communicated. Does that make sense? So it, there has to be a language in DNA, English, Spanish, Chinese, or like computer code. It has to be binary, on-off switches. The code in DNA is a four-letter code made um, from four sp separate sugars, A, G, C, and T. If you think about our modern computers, they run off of only two, a two-letter code, like an on-off switch, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. It's called a binary code. Now, how much information can you store in a computer that runs off of just a binary code with just two letters? How much information? The entire world's information is stored on that sort of a computer brain. Uh, information to create rockets um, down to the information to create a PowerPoint presentation all runs off of these two binary codes. Now, think about DNA. DNA is far more complex of a code than the code humans have come up with. Instead of binary, which is two, DNA has four codes, four letters to write codes. Scientists today believe that in a single section of DNA, you can have multiple layers of information, different information, um, all contained in a single section of DNA. Same sequence of uh, uh, in the DNA containing multiple layers of information. Incredible. Now, there needs to be a, also a communication channel. If you know a language, you need to have like a mouth to, to speak it, right? If information is going to be communicated. Same thing with DNA. If DNA has a code, that code somehow has to be trans transmitted out of the center of the cell into the cell nucleus where other machines, protein machines, can interact with the information. That transmission, the code of DNA is transmitted through RNA. RNA is the vehicle that carries that code out of the cell nucleus. And then third, there needs to be, the information needs to be meaningful information. In other words, if in DNA you simply had a code that told the story of a pink elephant that lived in the jungle, that wouldn't be meaningful information for life, right? It wouldn't. You'd, it would be information. There once was a pink elephant. It roamed in a jungle far, far away from here. It would be information, but it wouldn't be useful information. In order for the information to be relevant to life and useful to life, that information has to be meaningful. It has to be specific, very specific. So how was the language in DNA developed? Why is there highly specific information at all in DNA? And where did the information in DNA come from? Well, first, the information in DNA has nothing to do with the actual physical DNA structure. You may, you may find this surprising, but think about this. Here I have two paces, pieces of paper. Chemically, these two pieces of paper are made up of the same things. They're both made up of paper and ink. But which one contains information? The English Renaissance of Art. That one contains information. Well, how do you know this one contains information and this one doesn't? This one has meaning, it has order, it has, um, it has properties that exist outside of its physical structure, right? Information is not necessarily tied to the physical structure. So the chemical components of DNA does not explain the information in DNA. You'll never be able to explain how paper and ink and a book chemically evolved and then use the chemical evolution to explain how Shakespeare was written. Does that make sense? Information only has one source. In all the universe, information only comes from an intelligent source. There's no other source, no other known source in all the universe where information comes from. Let me illustrate this. 
Uh, scientists have set up a program looking for intelligence out in the vast unknown. NASA calls this program SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Now let's say that as NASA is listening in outer space, all of a sudden a code comes in. S-O-S, S-O-S, in short little beeps. Beep, 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 beep. What would scientists conclude? Uh, intelligence. There must be some alien aircraft or some sort of intelligent being out there that is beaming us this message, SOS, SOS. Now what about here on earth? When we discover information, what do we infer? Well, just think about petroglyphs in Arizona and other places. You'll find, sometimes stumble across these pictures on rocks that look like sheep or stars or humans or other objects. What does a hiker or a scientist with his PhD automatically assume when these shapes are discovered? Does he automatically assume, well, over vast amounts of time, the rain has made this sheep appear on this rock? <laughs> no. Why? Because whenever a scientist, whenever a human sees anything that involves information, the automatic assumption is this came from an intelligent source. Automatically, because that's the only source of information that we know of in the universe. A tribe of Indians must have painted them on the rocks. They came from an intelligent source. They didn't evolve. Information comes from intelligence. Without intelligence, you just have randomness. And randomness does not produce information. Books, CDs, videos, even paintings and museums all have an author, a creator, an intelligent desire, designer. DNA contains a more advanced information than anything we've ever built or ever discovered. That information in DNA that is absolutely necessary for a working cell to exist and for any organism to have life came from an intelligent source. The DNA book was written by an intelligent author. The masterpiece of DNA was sculpted out through the working of some creator. When you look at a DNA molecule, you aren't just looking at ink and paper. You're looking at something that was designed, something that was purposefully coded that specific way. Henry Quasler, a molecular biologist, says that the creation of new information is habitually associated with conscious activity. Richard Dawkins even says that the machine code of the genes is uncannily computer-like apart from differences in jargon. The pages of a molecular biology journal might be interchanged with those of a computer engineering journal. Francis Crick said this telling statement, biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed but evolved. What is Francis Crick saying? He's saying when biologists go and do their work in science, they see evidence over and over and over and over again that indicates that what they're working with, what they're researching and what they're, where they're working with was designed. But they have to tell themselves, this can't be designed, it must be evolved. Why? Because there is an agenda in the scientific community to hold strictly to one world view despite what the evidence says. If you're looking for truth, if you're researching for truth and you're willing to go wherever the evidence leads, you don't need to close your eyes or stop your ears and say, I know it looks one way, but it's evolved, it's evolved, it's evolved. You can look at evidence objectively and say, hmm, is there any other explanation? If there is no other explanation, let me go down this road as far as I can go. Now, what about junk DNA? Well, only 2% of DNA is used to make proteins, so scientists have assumed that 98% must be junk, leftovers from, um, from millions of years of evolving. This seemed to provide huge support 
of evolution and a crushing blow to intelligent design. But it turns out they were wrong. In an impressive series of more than 30 papers published in several journals, including Nature, Genome Research, Genome Biology, Science and Cell, scientists now report that these vast stretches of seeming junk DNA are actually the seat of crucial gene-controlling activity. Junk DNA? There's no such thing as junk DNA, according to current research. The next crushing blow came with the discovery of genetic entropy. But this time, the crushing blow was on Darwinian evolution. Genetic entropy is the discovery that information in DNA is degrading over time. Like an old book that's slowly crumbling apart with age. Rather than supporting evolution's idea that new genetic information is being created all the time, genetic en entropy actually shows observable evidence of just the opposite. Instead, genetic information is being degraded or completely lost over time across the board around the world. Every time a cell divides, three mutations occur. These are the mutations that caught us, cause us to get old and die. A portion of the mutations in each person is passed on to their offspring, thus, Every generation begins with more mutations in their DNA than their parents. The human race is slowly degenerating. Now, some may say genetic mutations are good. That's how evolution works, right? Through gene mutations. Evolution teach, teaches that the only way for the cell to evolve is through genetic mutation. However... According to Brianna Pobinar, an anthrop anthropologist, mutations are basically the raw material on which evolution acts. In other words, if one creature is going to evolve into another, it has to happen through the mutation of the genetic code in DNA. All the evidence in science shows that mutations can only remove or alter information that is already present. Mutations can never add new information into DNA. It can only take information away. It can never what? It can never add, it can only subtract, right? Or, or change or twist. This loss of information can sometimes have beneficial side effects, such as in the case of sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is a disease that affects individuals whose blood cells are mutated to be moon-shaped instead of the smooth donut shape of a typical blood cell. It causes people to become immune to malaria in Africa. The malaria cannot attach to the sickle cells because of their, their shape. However, just because it has a benefit, it also has um, some detrimental problems. Its shape can cause blood vessel blockage leading to anemia, low blood oxygen, increased risk of bacterial infection, and increased risk of stroke. Mutations work in the wrong directions, friends, for evolution by destroying information, not creating new information. Thus, even mutations are a problem for evolution. Now remember, Darwin said, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would what? Absolutely break down. So here's the question. Without the first cell or the first life, can Darwin's theory work? No. Is it possible to get the first life through numerous successive slight modification based on what you've seen tonight? There's just no way. It's not possible. So here's Darwin's dilemma. You need proteins in order to form a basic cell. Stanley Miller showed that amino acids, which are in a chain to form proteins, can form from chemicals. However, there isn't enough time in all the universe for the amino acids to get the right sequence for a small protein chain to form. This problem is compounded because you also need the right bonds, peptide bonds, and you also need the right bins, left-handed bins, and then you need the protein to fold, and then you need 215 proteins in order to have a single cell. It just can't happen. And 
what we know is that single-celled organisms and specifically proteins come through the information in DNA. DNA is needed to form proteins and enzymes, both of which are needed to read the information in DNA. It is the information in DNA that is crucial to making proteins. This information cannot be explained by chemical evolution. We readily observe that information comes only from intelligent sources. And junk DNA is a myth. So no known mutation is capable of adding new information to DNA, but can only destroy or alter current information. Mutations can't explain why DNA has information at all. Where did it come from? Intelligent design is the only theory that can cur currently answer Darwin's dilemma. As you consider the information together, how many could say that evolution has some significant hurdles? Anybody here? Yeah. Tomorrow night, we're going to climb the evolutionary tree and look at evidence in the animal kingdom. Does science, current modern science, still support evolution? And then the following night, we're going to look at Darwin's nightmare, the fossil record. Thank you, everybody, and have a good night.